Hey guys, welcome. We're live yet again. Chris Taylor, how are you? Doing well. Yeah, great. Great to be here. That's great. We're one hour earlier today, which I know is um, is a much better time for you, Chris, being in being in London at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. Happy we could happy we could uh, facilitate that. And I guess why not? For me, it's it's nine a.m. How about how about for you, Taylor? Where where about you and what time? It's uh three p.m. in Denver, and this is actually perfect because uh, I'm, a, I'm a Washington Capitals fan, and they play at five. So uh, if this was if this was later, and uh, you'd be, we'd be overlapping with the game. So I'm happy. <laughs> we'll see you on your phone the whole time, kind of holding it, just <laughs> off the so you can watch exactly what's going on. So for those people who are tuning in for the first time, whether you know we're live on Twitch, LinkedIn, or watching the VOD later. Um, we'll start with you, Taylor. Can you just give a really quick rundown as to who you are and what Convoy Ventures is, but also in particular, what sort of companies are Convoy investing into and, and what are you looking at in the market? Yeah, so uh, I'm a senior associate at Convoy Ventures. We're an esports and gaming uh, VC based in Denver. We also have one office in New York. We are we consider ourselves early stage, so that pre-seed, seed stage, but Series A is not usually out of our reach, but we tend to lean more on the lower valuations and earlier stage companies. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we invest in what we like to describe it as the picks and shovels of the market or the or the infrastructure and technology that the future of esports and gaming will be built on. So uh, when, when a lot of people hear about esports, they like to think about esports organizations because they take out most of the headlines, but we actually don't invest in esports organizations, but we invest in esports tools. Um, and then on the gaming side, um, again, everyone everyone hears about the the Fortnites and the Call of Duties of the world and you know, team fight tactics coming out, but we don't actually invest in game studios either. So on the gaming side, it's a lot of um, developer tools, uh, monetization tools, user retention tools, so things that can be used across games and don't really rely on the success of a particular IP. Can you explain for those people who aren't really aware of the whole investment market? Like, like why a company would choose to invest in a smaller earlier stage like you guys with, with the seed and, and kind of angel and, and not into the series A? So we, we like to go earlier because, well, mainly on our side, it's based on just the, the risk reward. We're gonna, we wanna take larger positions in earlier companies. And while they do have a higher risk profile than a series A company would have, that's, that's sure. already generating revenue. These ones offer us a, greater potential appreciation of value uh, for, for each dollar we put in. And um, we also get to work and kind of mold these companies and, and, and build them with, with the founders instead of joining the founders. It, it almost mm -hmm. seems more like we're, we're in this together instead of just piggybacking on a, on a really strong company and, and you know, just adding a little capital to the fire. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great explanation. You know, for me, when I started doing research on the market, I had no idea, and something I've talked about so much that helped me was the pitch by Gimlet Media, a podcast that's kind of similar to this, except it's live, and understanding why, you know, what the different investors were. Often they'd have an angel who was a person who had a successful exit themselves, and, you know, they're not investing any more than 20K, but they're almost becoming a founder. Oh, sorry, more than mm -hmm. 200K, but, but they're almost becoming a founder themselves. They want to join mm -hmm. something really early. Whereas there was another another guy on there, very experienced venture capitalist who doesn't write a check smaller than 500, but you need to have a lot of revenue on the board before they'll even jump on because they want to jump on board and use their contacts to scale your revenue. So it's like mm -hmm. very different. And like you were saying, you know, you want to get in early with the company so you can influence. And sometimes that could mean it becomes less of a bet because you're betting on yourself as much as you're betting on the founders, right? And you know that, you know, if you can uh, guide them throughout the stage, it's, it's not just like chucking $50 on a, on a horse to win. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like chucking $50 on a horse, but also you get to ride it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's, it's fun this way too. You get the, the founders are, are, are dreamers and they, you know, they have a, like a visionary mentality where you know you get to you get to come in and, and help mold this this grand vision that they that they bring to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so that's that's Taylor. Chris, let us know a bit about yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm Chris Day, uh, and I'm one of the portfolio managers at Weed Sports. Um, so Weed Sports is sort of uh, a bit different than what Taylor is doing. So we have a wider net. Um, so we're focused as a whole. So 
that's sort of three different verticals. Um, so it's connected athletes, which is things like wearables, um, fan engagement models, which can definitely be in the esports realm, but also for traditional sports. Mm. Um, and then the third space where I sort of spend most of my time is in sports betting and then esports as well. Um, so we invest across a couple stages for a couple of different vehicles. So we have uh, two accelerators, one based in Berlin, and we've just announced a second one uh, based in Lake Nona, which is in Florida. Um, is actually the first smart city um, based in the U.S. where there's going to be 5G-enabled technology throughout the city. Um, and then we also have a seed stage investment vehicle, which for the most part generally does follow-on investing in our accelerator investments, uh, which mm -hmm. are very early stage, so pre-seed and seed. Um, and now we also have a Series A fund called the Advantage Fund, which does Series A investing. It seems to me like a lot of similarities between what you guys are doing and almost like if you're running the, imagine you're running the summer baseball coaching camps for the high school kids. It's like you get to train them, but then you get to really see them from the foundation as to who's the best. And that makes sense for like what you're saying with your seed investment, right? You can kind of help to train these people as they're really early in the piece. And then you can find out, okay, I've got a wide, I've got a wide net of companies. And also I've got a large amount of companies that are funneling through this funnel. You know, let me just cherry pick the best ones out of here and then, you know, chuck a little bit more cash into them and get involved. Is that is that right? Yeah, definitely. So we've done in three years, we've done 32 investments um, because each of our cohorts yeah. have between five and 10 startups. Um, so it is, you know, ultimately we, we can't support all those startups going through to, through every um, avenue um, and every part mm -hmm. of our vehicle. Um, but what we hope to do in an ideal world is have some of our companies be invested in from each uh, individual vehicle. And as you said, I think it's really exciting what you can see a company grow from. I mean, in our first year, we very much had some companies that were just a, sort of a deck in a team. Mm -hmm. Moved a bit later stage now, but I think that's just generally the market in general is it's easier now more than ever with sort of no, co no code tools for a team to actually develop at least an MVP product. Um, so we are slightly later in the companies we're seeing now, um, but I think that's just mm -hmm. a testament to the resources out there for entrepreneurs now. Yeah, fantastic. So getting straight into it, the first of three founders that we have in here today is Bill Freeman from pureskill.gg. So the bio for himself before we bring him in is, we are building an automated coach for video game players. We use statistics, data science, and artificial intelligence to assess a gamer's skill in different categories and give personalized advice on how to get better. So it's, I see some similarities between uh, a previous AI coaching company, Try Harder, that we had on, I think it was last last time, so two mm -hmm. weeks ago, so we're really interested to talk. And, you know, Bill Freeman, as, as listed on his LinkedIn profile, also has a PhD, so I'd assume he knows what he's talking about. So it should be an interesting chat. We'll get him in. Bill, welcome, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you? Yeah, good, mate, good. Well, you've got the floor for the next, next 10, 15 minutes before we launch into a bit of a Q&A, so go for it. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for having me. So, um, so one of the reasons esports are so popular these days is that people are actually playing the games that they watch. They want to see how the pros are doing things, how they how they do you know how they do things the best, right? And so these games are most of these games are competitive multiplayer games. So they have some kind of rank system. So to many people playing, it feels like they're stuck in a lower rank than they deserve. And this issue is so common, it's got a nickname, right? Elo Hell. Um, and so that's exactly who we want to help out with uh, pureskill.gg. So to get better at a game, you need to navigate tons of tutorials, tools to try to find the right one that helps you solve your specific problems. And so there are thousands of guides on YouTube. Um, and as well in CSGO, we have these custom maps like target practice, spray control, movement, jumping, retakes, deathmatch. Uh, it can get overwhelming. Um, and so if you don't know your own problems, you need to get some help to figure that out, to lead you to the right source to help you get better. Um, so one way to do that is to hire some kind of coach, like an experienced gamer for something like 15 bucks an hour. Um, there are some sites like Gamer Sensei or Snowball.gg that, that do this. Um, but to work with a coach, you need to first look through a bunch of ratings and reviews, find one, message them, coordinate on a time, and then at the end of the day, they look at about an hour of your gameplay. And many gamers we found play more than like 20 hours a week. So in fact, this coach, you know, if you hire them for one hour a month, is going to miss, you know, 99% of your gameplay. So they're not even going to see most of the mistakes that you make. Um, and so in addition to coaches, there's also a few, a number of statistical tools out there to, to help people get better, 
what they do is analyze your numbers, give you some sort of metric. Uh, so some companies like Mobilytics are, are doing this. And so pure statistics lack a certain context about how those numbers were generated. And it's, it's almost like having some kind of Excel spreadsheet as a coach, uh, we, you know, we want to do AI coaching. So it's, you know, I don't know which coach just tells you about your statistics. It's often a lot more than that. Um, and so we want to offer a better solution with AI powered coaching through pureskill.gg. And so this works by using our custom data extraction on replay files to build a perfect reproduction of what happened in a match. And then we use data from thousands of matches to build models of player behavior to understand the patterns between good and bad players. Then we use these models that we've built to detect mistakes that players make, tell them exactly how to fix it in plain English. And then with this system, we can analyze pretty much every single match they play instantly for something like 15 bucks a month. So currently we've launched a closed alpha for the game CSGO. Right now, everything we've built only works on CSGO. And so we have 150 users testing it, 3000 more on a waiting list to get in. And our testers have uploaded upwards of 800 matches in CSGO since January. And um, what we do, what our, what our current state is, we can extract their data in the cloud and visualize that data that we extracted in a convenient 2D demo viewer in the browser. And so this match viewer will keep people interested while we uh, begin to roll out this mistake detection software, which isn't quite on the site yet. A lot of that is built locally, and we're working to get that running in the cloud. And so for example, the mistakes we can find in CSGO are stuff like missed smoke grenades through clustering and economic mistakes through types of decision trees. Um, so I have a, a statistic for you guys, uh, Chris, I know you said you're a CSGO player, but uh, I looked at economy for one specific mistake and it was buying nothing on the first round in CSGO. All right, agreed that that's a pretty bad mistake. 33% of all silver players are making that mistake. And it's very easy to fix by buying anything. And so we could just tell them, once we detect something like that, we can just tell them, hey, we noticed this. Here's something that you should do instead. Here's a guide, you know, the existing guide on economy that you should go and check out. Um, and I also want to mention that the uh, this 2D demo viewer that we've put out as basically our MVP, there are two sites, Noesis and Theorycraft.gg, who have 2D demo viewers as their only product and are charging 15 to 10 bucks a month. Um, so uh, moving on to our, our uh, team, our co-founding team of three, all met in grad school about five years ago. We've been an official company for about 10 months. Our CTO, Evan Sosenko, has a PhD in physics and also works as a senior software engineer doing a lot of back-end development. He's played a lot of StarCraft, Dota, CSGO, and EVE. And I actually know that he's built some sort of EVE tool that helps EVE players that's pretty popular. I don't really know what EVE players do, but uh, you know he's, he's helped a bunch of players out in the past. Um, our chief science officer, Ethan Batson, has uh, MS in physics, works as a data scientist at Bungie right now, he used to work at uh, Minecraft. And um, I have a PhD in physics as well, worked as a data scientist at a few places. Right now I'm full-time on pureskill.gg. I've been on more than a dozen CSGO teams, as well as a few Dota and Overwatch teams. I've actually won money playing Overwatch, you know, um, and, uh, you know, a while back, I actually wrote this pretty popular Reddit post that was a calculation on how many loot boxes it took to get a full set of Overwatch items. And there were a couple of articles about this from like Forbes and Polygon. And then two months later, Blizzard changed how the loot box system worked to reduce the number of duplicates. So, you know, Overwatch players, uh, you're welcome. I'll unnecessarily take credit for that. Uh, but basically I'm saying that we, we, we're not only gamers, we have you know this intense technical background. We also have been writing sort of software to help gamers out for years. And so right now we're basically looking for around 50K in pre-seed funding that will enable us to bring the assessments that we've built, this mistake detection, to the front end, as well as update our looks a little bit. We focus a lot on functionality uh, up to this point. And so after our first assessments are out there, what we want to do is create um, basically an early adopter program that gets people like early access to new assessments for like a pretty small monthly cost and then some added benefits once we finally launch. So crucially, this will get us towards that monetization uh, sort of state. 
And so we're really looking for the right investor who will help us either with later, larger rounds of funding, or can help us get more connected to the game industry, either through pro teams or game developers. So we're really looking for the right person to, to help move us forward. So we plan on eventually supporting Fortnite, League of Legends, Rocket League, uh, Dota, StarCraft II. And so uh, that's pretty much it. And we're hoping to find an angel who will help us get gamers out of hell. <laughs> good, good stuff. But before we kick off, I just wanted to know what what was the what was the number of loot boxes in Overwatch? This that was like, required to get full set. So this was like years. This is like three years ago, maybe two years ago. It was like fourteen hundred mm -hmm. loot boxes. Fourteen hundred. Wow. And, and how much does it cost per to acquire a loot box or to open one? Oh, I don't know. I think it's like ten bucks for four or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It yeah. was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that figures out to be a lot of money. Yeah, there was a there was a Senate inquiry into loot boxes in Australia. Even you know it got down here. So, right, and yeah. you know that that was motivated by a lot of people just not understanding loot boxes. And so I was hoping that this post would help people understand loot boxes more. But I think it just caused more people to argue. But you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it for me, Chris Taylor. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Yeah, um, my, my first question is, are, are you guys analyzing data from professionals or from your guys' users to actually build out these models? Our users. Um, so yeah. so how, how, do, how does this work if, I mean, if, if you're going for, if, you're, if your user base is, or the target market is people that are in this ELO hell, how are you, how are you guaranteeing, or how are you making sure that you have good data to compare to other users to give them, give them pointers? Uh, right, good question. So we in CSGO, we actually have their their ranks as a player. So people who are global elite are in the top 0.5%. And, um, you know, realistically, what we're building is for people in like the bottom 90% or so. Uh, so, so like, um, basically, we, we know the tendencies of players as they increase in rank. So when a player is in silver, we can say, you know, here's what you need to do to get to Gold Nova. Here's what you need to do from Gold Nova up to the next level to level to level. And once they hit global, yes, it's going to it's actually going to stop working uh, to get them to the next stage. But, you know, so, so there is a ceiling at which you, you hit and you guys believe your models won't really have much impact at, at any point. That's right. There are there are actually a couple of companies trying to do similar things for professional players, shadow.gg, mm -hmm. uh, stats helix, I think. Um, so the, the professional market was not our target. And then um, how is gameplay being siloed? When you, when you analyze it, are you guys, are you guys um, classifying an entire match as this is bad? Or is it like specific highlights, like just the, the throwing of a smoke grenade? Like, that was bad. So we see this again, we're going to let somebody else know that that was also bad. How are you? I'm trying to figure out how the data you're analyzing is being like compartmentalized to to uh, be looked at later. Uh, right. So a lot of it does require us to put guardrails on it by hand. So, for instance, like smoke grenades in CS:GO, I can. Uh, what I do is initially find a lot of them through clustering. And so it doesn't even matter about rank. I just look at the clusters and say, aha, here is where people are trying to throw the smoke grenade. And then something that lands near a cluster, but not quite in it, it's like there's a gigantic gap in that smoke. It's ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, so the we can look at things by player rank, um, but it, it also does require a lot of uh, guardrails put in just by hand. And then can can you take this information and give users uh, pointers through a, through like a, a, a training session or through like, you know, they go into a, they just go into the map alone and get to practice this kind of stuff or how is, how is the user getting feedback? So they, uh, this is, this is the part that's still being completely built out, but the idea was to link them towards the existing resource that helps them. So there are, you know, all these kinds of guides, maps, uh, you know, hey, our advice is that you should go learn how to surf. Our advice is you should practice KZ maps to get better at jumping. Um, so to to link them to the existing resource out there, like, hey, look at this YouTube video that you know already has two million views about how to throw smokes T side on it Inferno. Like the, the fact that they, they 
uh, you know, we want to point them to that specific resource that helps them. Why wouldn't why wouldn't you guys create these resources yourself to to keep the customers or in your users within within your your own platform? Because I mean, it seems like they're gonna if if the issue seems to be consistent, then it's they're just gonna go to YouTube and or go to use another resource to to figure it out. And I think that um, I think that hurts your your stickiness as a as a platform. Is there any future plans to create these resources yourself? Uh, we could do that. It's definitely not off the table. Um, it just seems like there are so much, so many existing resources. It would be a shame to not link to those already. Mm -hmm. Plus, linking to you know these, uh, you know, existing influencers who have millions of views and people agree are, you know, almost authoritative. Say like, here's that one video from that one guy that you already know that tells you what to do, right? So it adds a bit of authority from a third party that we may not necessarily have. Mm -hmm. um, but it's and, not uh, and then from a um, business model standpoint, is there a free? Is there maybe a free tier or something that kind of gets people in the door? And, and what would that what would that look like? Right, free tier. Um, it could be keeping that demo viewer uh, for uh, you know as our free tier that help that demo viewer really lets you do a sort of self assessment, which is hard in CS:GO because the demo viewer in game is very janky. Um, so free tier to to basically collect a lot of data as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's the main goal of that. And then we can also run the assessment on them and say something like, "Hey, we detected three hundred mistakes that match. Maybe you should give us fifteen bucks to tell you what they were." How and how how many how many users or matches do you need to analyze before your models are actually actually effective? So that. That's a very broad question. I would say that we have right now more than 20,000 matches, and that is sufficient for anything I've tried. Mm -hmm. um, it could probably do it with less. And at the rate at which people play, um, we can, it, it's like, let's just assume it takes 10,000 matches. So if we have you know, 3,000 users playing 10,000 mm -hmm. matches, playing three matches a day, that's, mm -hmm. that hits your 10,000. And then, la and then, I guess, the last question is: uh, since you since you are playing on obviously moving to other games, uh, how how long do you believe a process takes to onboard another game or have have an effective offering for for another game? Or is that just something that you're going to be kind of just testing and figuring out as you go? Yeah, I think it it depends a bit on the data that we're working with. It depends on the game itself, how popular it is. Um, but I think the the key is getting, you know, downloading a lot of player data, building some MVP to attract users initially to collect the data, and then building the model, and then launching the paid product, right? Uh, so that's at least six to twelve months. But you can accelerate things with funding. I mean, for for reference, I've we've been a company for ten months, and. I had been working on stuff for at least six months before that. So it's it's a long process, but mm -hmm. can be accelerated with funding. Got it. And I'm sorry, one last thing. Does how, how have, have updates in CSGO ever drastically affected the quality of your guys' offering? Yeah, actually that's that's um so CSGO updates pretty slowly compared to other games. Like Fortnite has major patches every two to three months. Uh, CSGO definitely did update at some point and destroy some things that we're working on. Um, so I, I'll just say that I have a plan for that that I don't want to make completely public right now. Mm -hmm. That's uh, uh, I can email you more details on that. But cool, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. That, that's all I got. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so it sounds like I guess for the user experience that ultimately they're gonna they're gonna play matches, they're gonna submit the video, and then they're gonna get almost like a post game report of the things that they should do differently. Right. Um, so is is there any plans in the long term, or do you see a way where you could actually be sort of giving live real time coaching when they're playing their next games? Like, have you ever looked at something where there could be an overlay actually within the game when they're playing? So we absolutely do not ever want to do that. And that's because of uh, there's this company called Visor.gg. They were doing that for Overwatch. And ultimately, Overwatch said, 
that's cheating and banned them. Banned their, you know, their service from any anybody using that service would get banned. Okay, um, so fair enough. It's definitely too um, close to cheating. Okay, and then um, so as you mentioned, sort of a lot of the decisions are sort of decision decision tree processes. Can you give a couple examples of like just you know outside of smoke grades and um, those types of pre premeditated decisions where it'd be easy to come up with? What other skills are there that you could go into? Uh, so we we break it down into well CSGO we break down into like eight different skills. Uh, I mean, teamwork could be throwing smoke grenades at the same time. Teamwork could be, do you flash your teammate? Like, I think, um, you know, acknowledging good things is a part of coaching. So, I, like, acknowledging the good things that players do is is definitely part of it. So, figuring out that a player, for instance, boosted another player, and that the player that got boosted got the kill, but the player who did the boosting got not, no no metric for that. So we can we can actually have that as, as something we, we provide. Um, so, so I guess in, in a positive way then, so it's, it's almost less of, um, you know, individual things, but it's more holistic view of how that match went overall and the specific things within that that they could do to, uh, to improve. Uh, right, yeah, there's, there's good and bad things um, to, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't fully understand. So, so, I mean, at, at first I sort of took it that, you know, you'd point out like five different things, but actually it's sort of, yeah, as you said, it's, it's going to take a more holistic view and understand how that individual thing plays into the overall gameplay. It's not, it's not just the specific uh, skill within that game. Um, we, we more or less are breaking it down into different skills. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, that's, uh, it's sort of the divide and conquer method of solving the problem. It's a lot easier for me to say, uh, you know, did this, was this flashbang effective? Did this smoke land correctly versus did this smoke lead your entire team to winning the round? That's much harder to actually figure out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just this, this, this whole business actually started because I was doing this sort of coaching by hand and players in silver and gold Nova are just very, they have very basic problems. They, they miss smokes, they team flash, they block their teammates. Um, just finding those things is extremely valuable because in my past experience coaching players, that's what I've told them. And they said it was valuable. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why you're seeing, seeing appeal, um, as I think it was previously referenced, not necessarily to the professional esports uh, players, but more to the, um, to the average player. That's right. Okay. Right. And if, if, I think the maybe the the best way to think about it is really mistake detection. And as you get better, you make less mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. And I'll, real real quick, um, uh, you, since you're only using fifty k, how how long do you expect that to to last you? And what what are the use of funds that you you think this will go towards? All right. So the so we've restricted the number of users. We're building this pretty much all in-house. Our burn rate is under $300 a month. So this is mostly for contractors to help us buff out the front end and get these assessments, get some system, put the assessments up there. Um, and so, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Uh, I just think what, I was, uh, what, was, what was it going towards? But it sounds like right. uh, not, not very much. And so it should last you guys a decent amount. So I guess my question there would be, well, contractors are expensive. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was thinking the $300 a month was what you were staying at. Um, what, how, how does this work for you and your two other uh, founders from a, from a salary standpoint? Obviously, this is, you know, not, not paying yourselves, it seems like. No, it's so, so the 50K would be used for um, app design and mm -hmm. front end development to bring somebody who can, um, basically make it look like the vision that we have. Right now, we focused almost entirely on functionality. So it works, but it doesn't look very good. And so, I mean, for like a contractor from TopTal, for instance, maybe 2,500 a week. Mm -hmm. So that, that'll that last very few, very, very limited amount of time for, if there's ongoing front-end work. But the goal is to just have 
something built and complete, complete it with that 50K. Got it, got it. Okay, and, and then go directly into raising some sort of pre-seed, seed round. Uh, I mean, the, the goal was to get to monetization. So we'll see if we, if we need to even do that. Um, but then yes, later on, uh, like we, we don't need the funding to keep us running. We want it to move faster. Um, Got it. Great. Got it. Okay. Is there um, any any ideas at all from you guys to broaden your scope? It sounds like maybe there's some limitation if you're requiring direct players to submit um, their videos and only gather the feedback for them. Are you able to provide things like infographics more generalistic by scraping data from somewhere, by down, mass downloading demos from hltv.org and processing those to, to teach people in a in a wider sense rather than rather than specifically say just per person, can you say that, you know, on average everybody needs to train in these kind of areas and, and push that out as a package? Uh, we definitely can as some sort of marketing thing. Um, uh, we've seen that be successful. So like Mobilytics pushed out a lot of infographics and YouTube videos and they have a pretty substantial social media following. But at the end of the day, we need to convert to customers, to paying customers, mm -hmm. right? So um, that'll that'll definitely raise awareness. But if the product isn't good enough people to pay for, uh, it's not worth our time, right? We need to make And is there a way, is there a way for you guys to pull the the games that the people are playing without having you submit them. From my understanding, it seems like they have to finish the game, have a recording, and then submit that to you. Can you automatically pull that data? CSGO introduced an API sometime in November or something, sometime late last year, and we're mm -hmm. automatically pulling demos as soon as people finish them. As soon as people finish yeah. playing, we can pull it. Yeah, no worries. All right. Any, any other comments from you at all, Bill, or questions from Chris or Taylor? Um, no, I just, I'll just say if there are any, uh, data scientists out there who may be thinking about this, would could be a fun project to work on, get in touch with me. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions through contact me at bill at pureskill.gg. Fantastic. Thanks, Bill. We'll see you at the end. Chris Taylor, what do you, what do you think? What do you reckon? Uh, I, I definitely believe the, the, the future of coaching is going to be through these automated platforms that can analyze data quickly and just and, and give you recommendations. That is definitely the more scalable model. Um, I definitely believe it is going to be, I, I think a lot of people are attacking this um, in, in, in different ways, but um, when or if a platform, and I don't believe that it needs to be just one, but if a, a coaching platform does become the, the premier one, it'll most likely be something like this, because um, like like you mentioned, you uh, it, it's going to have to be post post game data that you're using instead of you know uh, during the game and definitely not through um, live coaching or or training sessions. These things those, those aren't scalable. And obviously, like you mentioned, the with Blizzard um, considering it cheating, which which I I do agree with them. Um, it's going to need to be something like this where I can up where I can just play my game and then go to the platform and they can tell me you did X, Y, and Z wrong. So I do uh this is I do believe this is a, a, a strong route to to go. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Um, I mean, yeah, it's funny you say that, Taylor, because I guess me coming from the traditional sports background, it, it, it wouldn't mm -hmm. I wouldn't really see it or perceive it as being cheating if you have like live coaching going on, because that's mm -hmm. sort of the way you generally get coached is actually in the practices while playing. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'd be interested to see if the industry does stay that way, or maybe we do see a change and a shift from the game developers allowing those sorts of technologies to actually come about. Um, so I, th I think maybe that's why I was struggling a bit with it a bit, because I think that when I think about a coach um, in traditional sports, and I think coaching is applicable to any area, um, I think it's mm -hmm. less less about just saying what someone shouldn't do and also helping them learn to do the right things. And so I think this is this definitely sounds like it would really point out your mistakes, but I'm maybe gr struggling to grasp if it's going to help users actually learn to be better. Mm. Yeah, I think my like touching on like what. You, like what you guys were just discussing then there was there was another thing that came out from sound blaster many years ago and i think it was attached to their graph their sound blaster audio card um the sound card if you put that into your pc it actually would have a separate hud that would tell you where the enemies are based on exactly where the sound is coming from 
<laughs> so it was <laughs> it was basically like cheating. And I don't think it ever got banned, but not many people use um, sound cards that you plug into your PCs anyway, not since like the late 90s because they're not really applicable anymore on board. Yeah, I, I know it's Fortnite. Good. Fortnite just allows you to just turn it on now. You, you can turn on the uh, like a, a visual indica indicator for where sound's coming from now. Oh, wow. There you go. Yeah, yeah I must have missed that. Yeah, and, and on the live coaching thing too. So for a long time, my understanding is that um, Call of Duty on console would allow the coach to stand behind the team and, and talk to them um, throughout while the gameplay is happening. And that came into CSGO for a while in the E-League era, but they killed it after a bit. So the coach could actually talk mid-round and make the calls for it. So the in-game leader no longer had to make the calls. So if you're doing that, you're at a massive advantage because the in-game leader, say legends like Khan from Fnatic and such, um, are never going to get that many kills because they're too busy thinking about what's going on throughout that whole time mm -hmm. to be able to actually focus on their skill. But if there's a coach standing behind, they can talk. But they change that now where the coach can only talk mid-round um, to people. That's kind of like the, that's kind of like football now, where the the, the coaches mic or fo American football, where the coaches mic that goes into the quarterback's helmet automatically gets turned off after the yeah. after you know i think it's 15 seconds left on the play clock mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah 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 it's exactly like that and it, they even went as far in cs 1.6 where every time you died as a player you would have fade to black so your screen would go completely black so you can't even make calls for other people because often what happens in amateur teams especially is someone's trying to clutch 1v3 and their teammates are yelling stuff at them all the time. Hey, did you see that guy? Like all that mm. kind of stuff. But obviously if you're a better player, that can be quite advantageous. Oh, um, yeah. Let's say I played a uh, four by three resolution a lot in, in CS to keep my aim the same. So that was going from CRT to a widescreen. So I would have black bars on the sides, but that meant for me that I would sometimes miss people on the left or the right because I didn't have as wide of a field of view, but I saw the advantageous thing that I wasn't great at aiming anyway, so I wanted every advantage I could get mm -hmm. to make sure I could still aim well, but I would sometimes miss people off the corner of my screen that other people could talk about. So, yeah, it's a really interesting one. Some, some of my opinion on it, you know, as a, as a massive nerd of Counter-Strike in the past, and I always talk about that my team was – was young and inexperienced. And the reason we were able to get up to top four, top six in Australia in a short period of time is because we were complete nerds about the game. So something like this really does interest me on a personal level because I would ask myself a lot of those questions. I would watch a demo exist from, from NIP and say, why is he checking that corner first, second, third? When does he throw a grenade? When does he pre-fire? You know, why is he doing these things? How do these people hold certain positions or attack certain parts on the map? I think that's good. The only bad the only negative thing for me is a lot of the time i think people don't want to listen and it was really hard for us to get five players who wanted to do that because no one wanted to go that in depth with things a lot of the time i felt like people just want to be spoon-fed information they wanted to just become better in those days especially in australia people would brag about not watching demos and replays and how much aim practice they did and how they could be good without trying um, which is, I think it's an Australian thing, part of our tall poppy <laughs> syndrome and such as well. But that was part of the reason why us as inexperienced youngsters could come up so quickly because we had did have that advantage. So if they can find those right people, be really interested to see as they roll out, yeah, what the user feedback is from them and whether, you know, just those general infographics and stuff is enough to, re to really keep them going on and to get people interested in the platform, whether people do really want to dive like super deep into what they're doing and where they're going wrong. There's, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't like criticism either. And to the fact that um, I know in the past, some CS 1.6 pros have said, never watch your own demos. There was some quote that my team captain, who was our best player, used to love to use, which was like, never, you know, I don't watch my own demos. It's like masturbating or something like that. <laughs> I'm that quote. But yeah, I'm, I'm really interested because to me, I'm quite passionate about this on a personal level. So I'm really interested to see where these guys go with it because I think if it takes off, it can be a great idea. And I really liked what he led with too, saying that um, most people think they should be a higher rank than they are because we all know that's so common. I was playing Dota 2 last night and there was a guy on my team who was flaming everyone else. And it's just a standard thing. It's like, yeah, mate, you're, you're only in this MMR bracket because everybody else is terrible and you're amazing. <laughs> you know, everybody else is holding you down and you're a god and you'll be at TI-10 on main stage winning next to OG, I'm sure. But at this stage, you're at three and a half MMR just because everyone else sucks. So, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's always a funny thing too. All right. So the next person we have in is Cody from Coach Dotty. So his bio is to be... An, a positive influence in gaming for mental and physical health and lifestyle. They want to promote a smart approach to learning skills such as reading and mindfulness through coaching in gameplay. So we'll add Cody in. 
Hey, hey. Cody, how are you? Doing great. How about you? Good, good. Thank you. So, mate, you've got the next 10, 15 minutes to take the floor. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so hello, hello, guys. My name is Cody LeFevre. It's an honor to be here. Really grateful for the opportunity. Um, first off, I'd like you to think about a coach in your life who made a huge impact, um, whether it was elementary, middle school, high school, professional life, sports. What was their impact and what about them made them a great coach? Um, for me, it was without a doubt my high school lacrosse coach, Mark Wilson. Um, he was a big advocate for the term student athlete, and he'd always say uh, student comes first. And I always thought it was corny as a kid, but now I kind of understand the importance how being a student of the game, regardless of the game, how much that contributes to your performance. Um, so no pressure. Does anyone want to share their answer of an impactful coach? No, my dad was always my coach, and he was uh, he wasn't the nicest guy uh, as, <laughs> as, as, as the son, but I, it was it was definitely impactful. Yeah, I think the weird the weird comment about not watching her in demos that was probably the best coach for me. He was our uh, in-game leader, our main fragger, and our coach at the same time. A bit of a wizard in Counter-Strike. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, actually, I've had a lot of good coaches um, through both um, playing poker, tennis, and now Olympic weightlifting. And I do think a coach has to take a holistic view of the person, um, not just the individual skills that they're coaching them on. Sure. Love it. Thanks for sharing, guys. Um, so personally, I've been blessed to have many great coaches and teachers. And the impact that one person can have on your life in a short 30 minute conversation, an hour session, a whole season is just amazing. Um, so recently I had a conversation with a friend. We talked about how many people never get that opportunity. They never have a great coach in their life. And um, think about the esports industry. I don't see a lot of coaches who have much experience beyond the video game world or coaches who you'd consider like a classically trained educator. And not that that's necessary, but I hope to bridge that gap and give players a balanced and smart approach to physical and mental training. That's not just gonna help them improve their gaming, but extend much beyond that. Um, so today I'm looking to part for a partner for my esports coaching business. Uh, before I get into the details of kind of my longer term plans in the business, I, I feel it's important to give you my background. Um, so I have been playing sports and video games for over 20 years. I played college lacrosse for four years and graduated with a business and economics degree from Ursinus College. Um, from there, I went to be a substitute teacher and high school lacrosse coach for three years. And right, right from the start, I knew how much I loved it and felt the rewarding experience of it. So I went on to the University of Northern Colorado, got my master's degree in elementary education. Uh, there, I had a lot of great teachers um, that f shaped my philosophy, um, taught me many concepts and ideas that I was not aware of to begin with. Currently, I'm a full-time PE teacher. I coach high school lacrosse, and I've been coaching Fortnite for a little over two years. Um, it's been so rewarding to see the growth with players. Um, often in a session, with a 30-minute hour session, I could see 5, 10, 15 percentile point increase with a player, uh, especially if they're at the lower ends. Obviously, at the high end of a player, those percentage points are lower. But the amount of growth you can see with um, high-level coaching, I think, is really amazing. Um, so but after about a year and a half of coaching Fortnite on Fiverr.com, like a freelancing website, uh, I went on and was featured an article in the Washington Post on esports coaching that talked about a bunch of different games and different coaches. And then more recently, I've been promoting my coaching on TikTok and recently amassed uh, a little bit over 7,000 followers in two months. In terms of my plans for the coaching business, I have a lot, of, lot in mind, a lot of ideas, but I'm open to all feedback, all types of partnerships, um, open to all the possibilities. Um, I've coached over 250 players in small group, one-on-one -on -one sessions, ages 6 to 50, all across the world. I've done a couple sessions in Spanish. Um, I really love doing it, and I would love to continue doing that. Um, more recently, I'm working on some plans to run some esports camps. I got two or three in the works right now, hoping for summer 2020, and I really think that's a great opportunity. As I'm sure you know, esports camps are relatively new. Uh, I know as a kid, I lived for uh, dodgeball and camps in the summer. That was my everything. And I'm really excited to provide that opportunity for kids of and even adults. I'm open to that as well. Um, so I'm hoping to do that this summer in a local esports arena in Denver. Um, uh, overall, uh, I'm really excited about that opportunity with camps, like I mentioned, and I believe my holistic approach to learning and teaching, uh, my physical training and athletic background, my mental performance coaching are just unique to the industry. Uh, when you look at the esports industry, like I said, a lot of them don't have much experience, especially the coaches. It's just people that have been gaming. Um, they don't really have that background, I think, and I believe I provide a unique perspective there. And long term, I'd like to continue growing my social media presence, mostly through uh, Twitch and TikTok. 
And I think it's in, uh, important that I be a model and advocate for positivity and online etiquette. As you guys know, the gaming scene can be a little bit uh, toxic, as they say, and I really want to be uh, a positive influence in the community. Other than that, uh, I'd love to reach as many people as possible with my coaching. I really appreciate your time. Open to all feedback, all questions, and thank you for listening. Hey, Chris, Taylor, Chris Taylor. Yeah, Chris, I was going to say, you, you can go first this time. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting as, since in a way our previous one was also a coaching tool, whereas funny. it sounds like you're very much uh, an individual coach. Um, so is there a way, do you see sort of a way to scale out of, um, I guess, coaching rather than where it's just going to be your one-to-one -one hours? Um, do you have a, a view about how you're going to do that? Sure. Um, so love the one-to-one. -one. I love the small group sessions. I really love to work with teams. Um, I started kind of late in the Twitch and uh, social media game for Fortnite. So I think that's kind of hurt my uh, presence there, but I'd love to be able to help teams. I think I can be bring a lot of value there, not just on a performance level, mental coaching, physical training. Um, I think camps gives me the ability to reach a broader audience. Um, uh, we're working on a camp for 30 to 50, hopefully for the summer, for the first one. And I think that will be a great way to do it. I also um, I have an ebook working on other resources like that to provide on a larger scale. And then also maybe coaching other coaches, another thing I'm open to. And so uh, with the with the camps, then I guess, do you have a couple other coaches that you would also bring on? I, I assume it wouldn't just be you doing the coaching. Sure. Yeah. Um, so actually, for one of the camps, we're working on doing multiple games. So not just Fortnite. And I'll be collaborating with coaches from other games to create a curriculum. Uh, we're actually working on there's a turf field next door to the arena. We're going to have like physical training, PE style type games there, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I'm sorry. Could you restate your question? I, I lost it. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, so just, yeah, just generally understanding how you're going to scale more from just you individually coaching and bringing on other coaches as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess oh, would yeah. you eventually sort of like build like a tried and true model for these camps and then maybe try to, you know, outsource them or license out that specific training regime to other areas. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm definitely open to, to travel and to go around. I mean, you can knock out a bunch of camps in a summer, uh, depending on the length of them. One night experiences, two night, three, four day. We thought about doing a, a like a overnight type camp. Um, long term, sure, I'd be open to finding other coaches to bring them in. I will be working with other coaches this summer and coaches from other games. Um, so yeah, definitely all about the collaboration, willing to bring anybody in. That's um, all in for the message. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting since I think just generally, you know, I sort of say, you know, sports tech space, I think that 2020 is sort of the year of wellness. Um, so I think it's very, very much the year where people were taking on board their mental health. Um, and so it sounds like you're really looking at that more holistic view um, of, a, of an individual esports athletes and not just actually on the gameplay, but all the other things that when I think about it, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like the low hanging fruit that maybe it's not just that player's ability in the game. It's actually some underlying issues with their, with their diet or their exercise. They're going to make them a better performer in the, in the actual video game. Totally. There's been players dropping out for wrist issues, people dropping out from mental health. And there's just so many factors in there. Um, there's people who are gaming coaches that only focus on that aspect of health and mental health and, getting sleep schedules, stuff like that. And that's definitely important. I think it's, like you said, it's the year of, of health. I've seen a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so it also sounds like you're sort of quite early in doing this. Um, so are you, are you actually sort of have a business model where you're looking to raise funds or is it still at the stage where you're figuring that out? Um, I'm definitely willing and looking to raise funds. I'm not asking for um, a ton. I'm just look, kind of looking for five to 10,000 would be like that sweet spot for me. Um, I'm open, like I said, to all possibilities and, and larger, um, but that's kind of what I would be looking for. And yeah, we're in an early stage. Um, I've been doing the coaching for about two years now and working on growing it, just starting the camp thing this summer. Really excited for that. Great. Uh, yeah, that's all I had. Thank you. Um, how, how does your background translate to helping from the mental aspect of, um, of gaming? Because I, I do believe there is... Uh, the, the one issue that we're going to find as esports professionals grow up because they start at such a young age is that they don't know how to handle mental health issues. So um, how how are you planning on either leveraging your background or bringing somebody else in uh, to to help uh, mediate this issue? Sure. 
Um, so I've been a long time meditator and working on my mindfulness. Um, my partner is actually meditation certified as well. And I mean, there's so many components of mental health and all that. Um, so working people with one-on-one -on -one to help with that. Um, I've been big into psychology for several years. Um, I feel like I also my athletic background, mental toughness is very important in sports. Uh, mental training is very important. I know the big term in esports right now is tilting, um, being negatively affected by your mindset and uh, just helping people with that, giving them strategies to cope. Um, I think the nutrition and sleep stuff is can be huge just on that note. If you just identify those two as a problem and help fix that, that could be a huge uh, performance booster, especially on a team level. Um, and wh why do you believe this approach through one-on-one -on -one or group coaching is a better approach than something like what we saw earlier today or or a guides um type of a business model sure well shout out to bill i really loved his pitch i thought it was a great idea and i could totally see that being the future and helping people uh, on a massive scale um personally the real biggest reason i believe in it is just the results i've seen um just in a short session the little things you can identify in a small quick session and the plan you could give them after can make massive changes and i've seen that uh, many times. Um, I do think there is uh, room for, I mean, obviously YouTube is a big coach for people and people do things like BOD reviews and stuff like that. And that totally has value hundred um, percent. But the ability for a, a person who has a high level knowledge of a specific game to identify strengths and weaknesses and give you a plan, I just think is um, on a higher level right now than artificial intelligence is able to help with that. And our, um, does your individual specialty within gaming go outside of just Fortnite? I, I might miss that. Or are you um, going to bring somebody else on to do that? So currently I am specifically focusing on Fortnite. I mean, you name the game, I've played it. I've been a long time gamer, every genre I've played it all. Um, so personally right now I'm focusing on that for camps. And like I said, our other camps are going to include some other games. I'm going to work with other local experts, people across the country to help create that curriculum on a game by game basis. Um, but there will kind of be like a more general curriculum that's esports focused, health, mental health, physical health that will apply to all games. And have you uh, have you came up with a pricing model yet for this? So I have been going up and down on prices for the past two years on Fiverr.com, the freelancing website. I started just five dollars an hour, getting my five star reviews uh, to start, and I've been working my way up. Um, and then more recently, I switched to a different website. Uh, so it really is it's been changing based off demand. Um, and based off the situation. So for example, uh, for a while I started off with five, I was working up to 50, $60 an hour on fiber.com. More recently, I've been around $30 an hour and then I, my ebook is just $5. Um, in terms of camps, we're working on that. Um, but obviously that's a higher price point, especially the first one we're hoping to do is a four day experience. And I believe we set it at uh, 375 for that. Um, so there's a lot of w wiggle room there and different things I'll be providing. And you, and you said you want you can correct me if I'm wrong. You said you, anywhere from like 30 to 50 people would be kind of your your sweet spot. How do you, am I right about that? For a longer camp, that's kind of what we had yeah. been planning on. This is like my first big one. I'm really excited, but that was kind of our target. But smaller, I mean, smaller, the more attention to detail, more personal one-on-one -on -one coaching, that's great. That's kind of, yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at. When you have a group of 50 people, and even if it's, even if you have, um, you know, two people, you add two people, you guys are each, having to manage the relationships with over over 10 of your students and while coaching games there i mean it's it's kind of it, it's little things each day that can happen any time that that need to, that need attention where it's like hey you're in fortnite your editing skills aren't great or you um you know you're you're, you're holding down the trigger instead of instead of just clicking it so you're causing more bloom but without being able to consistently watch each individual, you may miss these things and uh, uh, for, or not be, or you may not be able to train them or give them pointers on the actual issues within their gameplay. So how do you, how do you mitigate the concerns of being able to allocate enough attention to each individual student at that, at that large of a, of a class? 
Sure. Um, so one way we had planned to do for that is kind of have it skill-based tiers uh, and then base the curriculum about around each tier. And then also offer a couple of things like everyone gets one session with me, a 15-minute one-on-one session. And in Fortnite specifically, the amount of growth you can make in 15, 30 minutes is unbelievable, I believe. Um, so that's one part, the skill-based uh, tiers. Um, we got a bunch of stuff in terms of the curriculum. I'd be happy to share that with you guys after if you're interested. Uh, so yeah, skill-based tiers. And then I'll offering the ability to work with me one-on-one -on -one for a small portion of the time. But I think the kind of general aspect stuff, the general training will be really helpful. And then there's always the ability to VOD review and then working with at a camp, hopefully that'll be a great way to get more one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. So they'll see the curriculum, they'll work on their tailored approach based off their skill level. And then maybe they'll come to me after and make even more growth. Got it. Um, that's all I have, but last thing, um, are you you're doing this training at the, the Lakewood Center? In yes. Denver? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, love we're, it. we're um, are, 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 are you based in Denver also right now? Or I am in Westminster between Boulder and Denver. Oh yeah. Well, um, I don't know if you knew that but since we're, we're based in Denver as well. Awesome. Yeah. I love it here. Yeah. That arena is amazing. Yeah, definitely. I'll, uh, I'll reach out to you uh, about uh, maybe meeting up or something after this. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting having the, um, the comparison between you know the AI service that's just been on for coaching and then also the personal. I think that it's 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 common that sometimes like us tech nerds can forget what it's like to be coached by a real person and to have them to understand our needs and to work with us through things. And we always look to you know how can we have that scalable platform? But then it's always it's it's also that way up of um, you know a scalable platform is is what an investor is often looking for because they're looking at that large company valuation and are you capped? But I think the summer camps thing sounds really interesting to me. We tried something similar in Australia. It didn't work for us due to a few different reasons, but also a smaller market and we did it too early. But I'm really interested to see how that goes because I know that, you know, there's even soccer camps that happen here in Australia that are, you know, multi-million dollar businesses and they only run two, three camps a year. You know, they'll, they'll fly out a, a B or C tier, um, you know, football player from London, chuck him on the bill and, you know, get thousands of kids through. For, and he'll go and spend three seconds with each, with each of them. They'll fanboy out and their parents will happily fork over $100, two, three hundred dollars for that coaching experience. But, you know, I guess at that stage, you're, you're functioning almost as much as a child minding service as you are as a coach. <laughs> but, yeah, sounds interesting to me. Yeah, any, any uh, future comments or, or questions from you guys at all before we move on? I'm good. Cool, cool bananas. All right, thanks, Cody. We'll see you at the end. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. What do you guys think? It's good uh, opposites from, from number one to number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely, definitely definitely different, but um, I it, it's interesting the way you you phrased, you phrased it uh, as a summer camp because I actually, when I was younger, I did do summer camps, which were for, I mean, I, mine were for basketball, but they, they were all-day events, and it was just playing basketball for eight hours straight. So, um while this, while he, well, he wants to, to frame it as a coaching and training uh, camp. This, this could easily be something where it's like a, a video gaming summer camp where you just come and play video. You, you get access to the the Lakewood Center, which, uh, if you guys don't know, is 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 super nice, massive, really cool, um, and they can just play video games all day instead of, and and it almost acts as a as a babysitter solution as well. Um, which, which does go into, I think, the point that me and Chris both made during that was that uh, the scaling aspect is going to be really tough. Uh, mm. But I don't think that that means it can't be successful on a on a smaller scale. Um, I'm a little skeptical about it about it being a venture deal, but I also um, see very successful camps across across the country for different sports. So um, definitely can be proven wrong in that aspect. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think I'd, I'd echo a lot of that. Um, you know, summer camp for me was one of the best times in my life. Um, I always went to tennis focused camps, but there was obviously so much more that was going on out there. Um, so I, I would really implore him to really look in, into and deeper. And, you know, if, if no one's doing video game focused camps, I think that's really exciting. Um, obviously, it's not going to be them training 12, 12 hours a day. It's going to be, you know, a couple hours of training. And then there's also going to be the physical activity. Um, and again, you know, the, the big movement in the world right now is people are going away from communities. But I think communities are so essential for people uh, to thrive, you know, that, that human interaction, um, taking away the coronavirus for a second. Um, I think, yeah, I, th I think maybe it's not a venture case, but I, th I think there is a very interesting underlying business model there. 
um, that he should explore. And as you said, Chris, if you start bringing in a couple, you know, well-known professional players or professional content creators, um, that could really sort of, you know, up the prize for, you know, a very small amount of extra work. Um, and that could be very interesting. Um, yeah, when you think about like a ninja sponsored um, summer camp, where you know he comes and speech speaks for it's really just going to up the pay grade a bit yeah exactly yeah i i remember seeing someone comment this on facebook many many years ago um asking Fnatic why they why they haven't done a summer camp you know this was probably way too early for them to do it but it would be awesome because a, a multi-team organization like Fnatic could bring you know one guy from rainbow six siege to run that in a section a guy from counter-strike a guy from league of legends you know all these different games and you can have that multifaceted like esports coaching festival where the kids can go off and learn about different games they want or, or one game and i guess it's you know like what both of you are saying about you know venture capital versus where your funding's from i think for those people watching that's why it's very important to understand um who you're who you're pitching to get the money from and who you need to be pitching to get the money from because sometimes people are looking for different stuff. Sometimes the VC is only looking to invest in something that's already making $500,000 revenue and will be, you know, with a guaranteed exit or a planned exit or, or death within three to four years kind of thing. But other times, some people are wanting that different type of scalability. Maybe the investment is better to come from that venue themselves. Maybe they would want to partner with it or another challenge venue that's opening. Maybe there's a new stadium that's that's just being built and they need something like this to be a point of difference. And the guy who's building it might throw 50K your way to, to purchase 50% of your company and give you a free venue and funnel money back through themselves. Who knows? But there's always, and I think that's a, I think that's a thing that people forget a lot of the time in esports. There's different investors for different types of things all the time. And I've seen in, for example, sponsorships, go down for, for very particular reasons. You know, maybe a big retailer has become involved with an esports team and Razor's trying to win over that retailer. So it's in Razor's best interest to throw 50K at that esports team, whether they think it's worth it or not whatsoever. And, you know, it's similar with investments, right? Sometimes there's, you know, very wide ranging reasons as to why people would invest. So keeping that in mind. All right. Next up, last but not least, Roberto from Esports Mania. So he explains it as a startup that has the objective to communicate, expand, and spread esports in Mexico and Latin America by generating inclusive experiences for anyone who may be interested in understanding, learning, or participating in the esports industry. Within their business model, they're focusing on three different units, and I'll let him explain that as part of it. I think for, for anyone who's been following my content, I've been trying to talk with a lot more people from, from Latin America. Um, I've been trying to talk to a lot of people, particularly from Mexico and Brazil, but I think it's a pretty underserved market and there are tens, hundreds of thousands of very passionate esports fans there that are, that are really loving that, that local stuff. So really interested to hear what he has to say. Roberto, welcome, how are you? Hi, hi guys, how are you? Good. Good, good, we've got the floor, mate, it's 10, 15, take it away. Perfect, thanks guys. Uh, well, first off, uh, just telling you about a bit of Esports Mania, right? Uh, this is a company that was founded uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and basically, uh, Chris described it very well. Like, uh, it's a very unattended market here. So there's a lot of esports opportunities. And from uh, our point of view, we want to bring uh, gamers and brands alike uh, the opportunity to really uh, start working in this market, right, from one point. Uh, and how we're doing this? Well, basically by building a very strong community that is helping us build the scene and the industry. Uh, you guys, um, for a change or in other countries, um, well, the esports market are already very, very well settled. And that's something that's not very uh, well done here in Mexico. We face a lot of challenges in that way. Uh, kind of like, um, there's not, the opportunity is there and it's huge. But the problem here is that the market is very, um, I don't know, let's say damaged in the way that some brands and some companies in the past have, haven't done the very best stuff to bring, bring the better of it, right? Um, and well, how, how did it all started, right? I was uh, studying abroad in France last year and uh, then I saw like all these small like gaming bars that were there and I thought of, wait, okay, what the hell, I should do that, right? That sounds like the best thing. I have been a gamer my whole life. But then when I got back here in Mexico, I realized that there were there wasn't even an industry or basic knowledge of 
what esports were and uh, how people could even start looking at the content that was esports related or find a place to go to tournaments or anything like that, right? Um, so this is how the idea started. Uh, I found my two co-founders that I'll tell you more about them a bit later. And, um, and basically here is that the, the good news was that uh, there was a lot of uh, unmet needs and a lot of uh, people uh, interested in looking into more esports content and places to go, tournaments, events, etc. right? So we started working on that. First off, we uh, built our, our community. Today, we are more than uh, 50K people uh, around our, uh, our social networks and platforms. Uh, here, uh, a quick note though, uh, you probably guys are gonna laugh about that uh, our community is more based on Facebook gaming, but the thing here is that Facebook gaming is quite big in Mexico and Latin America, which is a funny uh, fact, right? Because Twitch is a big deal. Uh, we also have our Twitch and uh, other accounts, and we are also planning to expand and perform a joint venture with some people in Argentina who, has a, who have a very broad Twitch community. But the thing here is that uh, Facebook is kind of like giving away a lot of uh, big opportunities for us, and that's where we have settled for and so far. Um, well, after generating our strong community, um, we already have like a, basically all our casual and hardcore gamers uh, kind of like involved in the activities that we have, and that's where our, our three main um, lines of business start, right? First up, we have the talent management. Uh, this goes from basically identifying people that are in the wild, that are gamers, that are interested in, in the esports side. They might not be the most pro players, or uh, they might not be the most, like, um, let's say, influencer type of gamer. We kind of look uh, into both. We want to find someone who's good at gaming, but at the same time is good at communicating stuff. But this is not a problem for us because, um, like, one of the key points of our business model is that we gather a lot of data from the recruiting that we do, right? We understand what games they like, if they are more into like a, a specific type of game or tournament, and if they have participated in them before, which ones, if they are local or, uh, or on other parts, and that gives us a lot of insights of how to uh, structure our own tournaments, what are the next game or trend that we should attack, and stuff like this, right? Uh, on the other hand, we, like I uh, said a little bit, we organized events and uh, tournaments based on this. Uh, last year, uh, I know Smash Bros. is not a huge uh, deal uh, uh, outside of some places, but here we organized uh, one of the largest um, Smash Brothers tournament here in Mexico. Uh, actually, MK Leo, which is the best uh, Smash, Bros. Smash Bros. player, uh, attended and some other uh, couple of players from abroad. So that uh, gives us a lot of impact here in Mexico, which is something that not really happens very often. The companies that used to do this type of things are um, a bit burned out uh, right now. They had some problems with uh, the payments, uh, and some other ones are from Spain, for instance. So that kind of gives us the edge and nowhere of knowing our market and our people, and uh, that's uh, something that has been great for us. Uh, on the other hand, we are starting to experiment with uh, online tournaments. Uh, we have a license uh, with G Arena. It's, uh, you know, the developers of uh, Free Fire, which is a very huge deal here in Latin America. Um, so we can start uh, doing official tournaments for, for the game. And they also gave us like access to their platform so we can have a more um, well-structured and organized tournaments and this type of thing, so that's uh, that's very good for us. It's something that I don't think no one else here in Mexico has, and uh, well, that's a, that's a great thing on our body proposition. Um, why are we doing it now? Well, basically here it's um, you know uh, all this uh, cho uh, all this business and uh, raising money that you guys uh, expose. It's kind of like very impressive for me because our very new idea is something that is very well unexplored here in Mexico. But for us, it's something that we're just starting building out, right? And um, I, I will talk about more of the metrics and the size of the business here in Mexico. Um, even like a fun fact, no, you guys are probably going to laugh at me because I brought a magazine, right? But this magazine is kind of like a, from the biggest 
or organiz financial organization here in Mexico that they wrote an article as, as their key point this month saying that uh, Mexico is a golden mine of, uh, on the esports side and no one is really taking a look at it. So that's basically what I, uh, what I would like to invite you guys to participate on. The other thing is that we're kind of attacking the Latino market that, uh, as you guys are probably were aware of, uh, in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of Latin uh, people that are uh, kind of like struggling to find an independence in this type of thing. So one of our uh, expansions and uh, future projects is to uh, go abroad to the U.S. And um, well, other than that, we have uh, done some very well and established very good customer relationships with some brands. Uh, we have a couple of sponsors and our model is more on the Okay, we have a very well established uh, platform with a broad uh, reach that goes over 3 million people each month. So let's do the, uh, a very specific marketing and digital um, advertising uh, model where basically brands want to announce their products and services within our channels. And uh, we also let the people or players that are joining our team uh, kind of like um, develop their profiles as pro players. We are not paying them right now, but the good thing is that we kind of like find the, uh, the best talent that is currently searching for opportunities here in Mexico. And then afterwards, we grow their profiles, we grow their skills, we give them cancel, and afterwards, uh, we kind of find deals with other brands or teams, as well as uh, we're looking for an expansion on this, um, on this business line, looking for team management where we are uh, looking at um, non-esports clubs that are looking to uh, develop a new team and kind of want to understand why they uh, why the esports are so big. Uh, we have talked with a couple of them here in Mexico. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, like soccer here in Mexico is a big deal. There are a lot of clubs here, uh, but they they all want to go with FIFA, right? And we tell them that that's not the best thing. We give them like, the whole broad strategy and what would be the best, how they can reach the people that are interested in these things and how to relate with them. And uh, what else? Well, um, I want to talk about just a bit about our uh, co-founders. Uh, one of them is Armando, he's my cousin. Uh, he's like our financial expert. We want to see him as the, you know, the little Zuckerberg that we have here because he's quite young. And on the other side, we have Victor. He's our digital marketing specialist. Uh, he basically has worked in the uh, AAA companies like uh, L'Oreal, Philip Morris, and AXA, and he has a whole uh, strategy point. And from my uh, side, I am a product manager looking to uh, attend all those unattended or unmet needs, uh, looking at all those uh, business model canvas and kind of well establishing the company for uh, anyone who wants to come with us. Uh, on the other side, we have two advisors, which are, are also our first uh, couple of investors. Um, one of them is a family member who is a former uh, Amazon employee, and by coincidence, the second one, who is a friend who used to be my boss, mm -hmm. is also a former Amazon employee. So they are giving us a lot of the insights that they got for a, from a company like that. They are currently living abroad, one of them in, uh, in Europe and the other one in, in, in Chile. Well, basically here we are kind of like well establishing our team. We already have more than six people working with us and our professional team as well, Maniacs. We have six professional um, uh, players. Uh, for instance, one of them is, uh, is the champion of Fortnite. That's, that's kind of weird to say, but uh, he basically um, won uh, the biggest tournament last year uh, in singles playing uh, Fortnite. And, um, in between you guys and, uh, and me, that's crazy because it's someone that just came and wanted to be part of the organization. We didn't even look at him and through our recruitment process, right? So um, we want to get this more on the side that uh, they are professional players that we can expand. We can show the profiles and uh, their brands as well with, uh, with uh, the key companies that want to explore. And uh, yeah, I think my last message would be uh, esports here are very uh, unattended, and that's why we grew so fast, to be honest. We're not finding the business model that is uh, something very uh, innovative in this way. I know that there are a lot of agencies in the US that do kind of this kind of stuff, but at the same time, there's no one here that really does it. We were in the Sports Summit last week, a very important summit, 
uh, re regarding traditional sports. And we were basically the only uh, esports company uh, outside of, uh, well, within Mexico, and not the ones that were from like Spain or other parts of, of the world that, that was attending this type of summit, right? So that, that's kind of like my message I want to give to you guys that were the opportunity really relies on. Awesome. Um, I'll start here. Uh, the, the first thing I wanted to, to ask you about was how much is, how much are you guys focusing on mobile gaming? Uh, well, we were not doing it so much, but since we closed the uh, deal with the GRN, I we're focusing now a lot on, on it. Yeah, because I was, I was going to say, you also said that your main streaming platform is uh, Facebook. Yep. On just 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 for for uh, for you to for you to know, Fa Facebook's top three games are um, all mobile games actually. So Facebook is kind of known at, as a as a mobile streaming platform. If you look at Twitch, it's you know top three are Fortnite, League of Legends, Grand Theft Auto. For YouTube, it's Fortnite, PUBG Mobile, League of Legends, Mixers, Fortnite, Paladins, Apex Legends. But then Facebook is PUBG Mobile, um, Darina Free Fire, and Mobile Legends. Bang bang. So. Um, I would, that would be my, I would give a little uh, advice there to maybe, maybe try to leverage some popular mobile titles through Facebook as well, because um, while the other, while the main three, the top three platforms are, are fighting over the same people, Facebook's kind of uh, digging itself a little, um, or, or becoming the, the mobile streaming platform, mobile game streaming platform. Um, and you said you guys' main game right now is Super Smash. No, no, that's just a tournament that we ran. Uh, our main game, I would say, is Fortnite right now. Uh, but our second main game is Free Fire. Okay, okay, got it. So the first, the, the Super Smash Pro part was part of um, the org ter tournament organization. Um, and I also may have missed this. You said uh, you were going through your different your different business uh, silos, and you you mentioned talent management. You mentioned yes. uh, organizing tournaments, and I did not get the third one. What was the third? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I, I, I didn't mention it. I was a bit nervous, I guess. <laughs> uh, um, it's a PR uh, marketing activation. So we have a broad partnership with a studio called Was Studios here in Mexico. Um, they are actually, from our point of view, the best uh, VR uh, studio development here. They have they own a Unity Award, for instance, and that's something that's global. So that's a, a great credential on their side. And uh, basically here what we do is that when we're closing on the events that we're doing, we offer uh, brand sponsors like, hey, here's, here's an additional point for you. You can uh, develop with us a marketing activation of, and that is eSport related with, with our co-partnership with uh, WAS Studios and you can work with them to not only have your own type of uh, thing going on here in the event, but also uh, generate a great awareness of your brand within the experience that we're uh, we're getting awesome. Um, how how are you guys either reflecting or leveraging the the Mexican culture through your guys' organization? Because when I, I I completely understand what you guys are building here, because um, I think similar to you know a country also like India, there for some reason esports is very uh, it, it, the countries itself are very underserved in the esports space and. Then, but when you look at an like a esports organization like Stralis, you just we all just know their damage. That's that's just it's just known. So what are you doing, or what is uh, esports mania doing to really leverage or, or um, reflect the, the Mexican culture in what you guys are actually building? Uh, well, we are kind of like including everyone that's interested in that way, right? And not like not even the player, not only the players that we have on our team, but we also have like um, you know invitationals and. Uh, very broad relationships with uh, the media outlets that are here. So we kind of like generating this type of content that is more related to the specific needs that we have or at the moment, I don't know, for instance, uh, coronavirus, right? That's a big thing. And Mexicans really enjoy making full of themselves, right? So we kind of like include this type of things as a joke kind of thing within our streams and kind of keep the trend going on in this type of things. Uh, as of giving it like the you know, the salsa that is a more Mexican based in this type of things, not only um, by having uh, like general esports content that uh, other organizations may do, 
On the other hand as well, we do a, uh, a lot of analysis on the data that we have, right? So uh, we kind of like see where our uh, viewership is more focused on, on what uh, states of the country they are, and we kind of like uh, trying to keep up with the uh, kind of like, I don't know, maybe there's a broad audience uh, related to Fortnite in one of our states, right? So we kind of like give that information and intel to our players and streamers, and we focus that on our calendar as well of content, and we kind of like uh, relate more on that side with, with this type of information. And uh, how, how are you guys, um, how are you guys currently going about getting like sponsorship deals? Because for an esports organization, I, I I don't know if I'm if I'm mis uh, misidentifying you guys as an esports organization, but um, if when I when I when I when it looks like you're doing this, you know, as a, almost like a, just like an esports company as a whole, but um, a lot of your guys' business relies on locking in sponsorship opportunities. Um, where where are you at with that outside of uh, Arena, and um, how and, and and what are you where are you guys seeing the most uh, the most traction from from a sponsorship point of view? Uh, for sure, it's on the non endemic brand so far. That's basically one of the points that probably you guys could help us out with. Uh, but uh, other than G Arena, we have uh, the sponsorship of uh, as of today of three sponsors. We just started looking at them in December, so it's not a bad thing, I, I think. Uh, one of them is uh, Berbatin, you know, the, the tech company um, that they own and Mad Cats, you know, those, uh, uh, you, you didn't get hear this from me, but those crappy controllers that we used to uh, hold when we were kids, uh, they have now like great um, keyboards and uh, headsets and stuff like this. And uh, we also have a partnership with a, uh, a local legal uh, firm that focuses on esports uh, related stuff. They just wanted to uh, generate a brand awareness on their side. Um, as of today, we are kind of seeking these um, uh, non-endemic brands, so we can offer them uh, specific like, like uh, esports plans, right? So uh, we have three types of them. Yeah. Uh, one of them is just related to the type of uh, peripherics and you know like uh, uh, products that they may provide. This is, goes all through the organic side of things. Like we don't promote or push monetarily uh, their brand, so they cannot be, uh, you know, reached by that, by that many people. But on the other hand, uh, so many brands are very happy just to give product to our uh, to our uh, team players, so they can use it during their streams and uh, generate some awareness. But the other plans, that the revenue driven, are the ones that. We basically generate a plan uh, for each queue or even a, a, a yearly plan where we uh, offer them, of course, that we're going to invest some of that money into their um, reach and the, the platform. That's where Facebook Gaming has helped us a lot. It's very, you know, like um, easy to basically find a strategy where you invest some money on it and it reaches, I don't know, uh, from 100k people, you can get to 1 million, right, in one single stream, some things like this. Is what uh, what we're offering them in a plan basis. Um, and then, are there, are there any comparable? I, I know you mentioned there are some some um, organizations that are similar to you guys from like Spain, but are there any comparable uh, organizations or companies doing the same thing in Mexico right now? Yeah, uh, I think our two main competitors are um, Skill Esports, which. Uh, it's basically an agency as well. They have been in the market for almost five years now. Well, we have a, a good relationship with them, right? Since we're all building this industry and this uh, scene, uh, we are kind of like all pushing forward to build the cake, right? But uh, what I can say uh, regarding them and us as a differentiator is that we have a very well engaged community and also they are uh, just, uh, I don't know, like we grew uh, basically the same type of community in one year and a half and they have been doing it for five years, right? So maybe they were not in the, in the right time that they started, but for us, I think we are in a very uh, good time So because we have grown uh, this rapid pace. Got it, that's, a, that, that's it for me. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so you mentioned obviously you have uh, 50,000 fans um, on the the wider scale and then on the talent management side how big is the the sort of pool of talent that you're managing at the moment uh we have uh eight professional players 
Um, six of them are Fortnite, one of them is Free Fire, and the other one is uh, Mortal Kombat. And uh, we also have like a, an influencer uh, mm -hmm. who's working with us. We, we kind of looked at them uh, apart in this uh, type of thing because she doesn't uh, participate in tournaments, for instance. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, on the operational side of the company, we have uh, four people working with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Two of them are community managers. One goes through the eSports Mania like main platform, uh, and the other one goes more, more to the uh, you know like social networks of the of the team itself. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a psychologist, a psycho I don't know if that's the right word in English, but uh, yep. yeah, um, who is helping the, the 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 team members out on their skills. They shouldn't get too mad, all that things like this. And uh, we also have a production and uh, specialist who basically does develop this thing right and behind me. Uh, this is our studio. It hasn't really been launched yet. Uh, this is my first time in it, <laughs> actually. And the guys right here on the these are our team, actually. These are maniacs. Uh, they are very young, as you probably were, are very well aware of. And um, and yeah, that's that's basically what we manage in our team. Okay, great. Um, and so at the moment, I guess, have you are you facilitating just brand sponsoring esports mania as a whole, or would they be sponsoring individual talents within the uh, the organization? Um, currently, we are uh, you know like. Uh, showing the whole picture to brands. The mm -hmm. idea here is to grow an individual um, profile so we mm -hmm. can also kind of find uh, specific sponsors for them. For instance, the guy that, that I told you that is the national champion of uh, Fortnite, there are a lot of brands that are looking into him, right? So uh, mm -hmm. we're kind of building his, um, his uh, profile in this way so we can also have that diversification on uh, the specific players as well. Yeah, no, because yeah, that's what I was sort of getting at. Is it feels like in the in the long term, you're almost going to be hopefully sort of a sponsorship marketplace. Would that be wrong to say? Um, you know, I wouldn't like to say only uh, sponsorship marketplace in that way because I know uh, that's one of the things that esports has been struggling a lot on the uh, revenue management. How it's going to work and sponsorships are not a big thing for the long term basis, but. Uh, as of like the midterm, yeah, you can kind of look at it that way because it's going to be a hub where we are basically uh, raising a lot of um, metrics, right? We're getting them KPIs on a specific uh, differentiators. So we are kind of bundling these, uh, these packages for brands so they can work out and kind of provide the specific services or product that they want to a specific uh, place that maybe they want to uh, attack hardcore players, right? Or maybe they want to go more on the mainstream side. So we're kind of like building all uh, all these scenarios. Yeah, no, um, so yeah, I guess what I'm sort of getting at, so in our accelerator last year, we had a company called Pits. Um, so they're a Mexican-based company. And so they're attacking the traditional sports market in Latin America. Um, so what they've created is sort of a sponsorship ma marketplace for amateur footballers. Um, so actually, so brands would be sponsoring amateur footballers. So I guess I was wondering if, you know, maybe that's sort of, you know, an option that you guys could sort of explore or if, if that was the possibility there is that it wouldn't be the brand sponsoring the team as a whole, it would be sponsoring these amateurs from the beginning um, and then sort of working with them on their way up um, to the professional level. Yeah, you know, like um, on that basis, like uh, our amateur players, well, even though they are, some of them play Fortnite professionally, they are kind of amateur in a lot of things, right? So uh, basically our deals that we perform with brands are kind of driven that way, right? Like all, all the benefits outside of the monetary ones are given to the players so they can like have uh, better uh, tech that they use. They can have, uh, I don't know, like um, better chairs and things like this. So we can kind of help them or aid them in that way. And uh, especially uh, from our side, we invest directly on their profiles so they can like look at, at maniacs as maybe not the professional uh, team where they go to like a gaming house and they practice all day long, but they, they can kind of like build their profile so they can apply it eventually to this type of team that they're looking for. And uh, we're giving the, that opportunity on that side. Okay. Um, and then out, outside of getting the brands, what, what are the biggest challenges you guys are facing right now? Um, 
as a, as a whole? Well, um, you know, as one of our key like uh, growing aspects is that uh, we want to have a gaming center and uh, that we are a bit struggling on that side because we don't have the monetary uh, option right now to do it. Uh, on the other hand is that there's too much market that we haven't been able to meet, right? So there are a lot of brands that are starting to look looking uh, uh, they're starting to looking us for us to find a you know like how to, they can attack the uh, Gen Z people. Uh, there are a lot of brands that want specific uh, events that we are currently kind of like ditching because we are not uh, we don't have the powerhouse to to perform this type of events, right? So there's a lot of market, and we're currently not even to be completely honest with you guys, not completely being able to um, meet it all, you know, like have uh, all these type of proposals or, or have a broader commercial team that may help us. Um, um, we just found our first uh, investment a couple of months ago, and I'll talk about uh, more about that later. But on the other hand, like uh, we are kind of like starting to uh, struggle on the side of the structure uh, of the organization, how we are going to uh, kind of like start exploring uh, on a broader basis, but also giving, uh, you know, the support to this type of clients that we really want to work with. All right, great. That was all I had. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I don't, I don't think I have any more questions. I think you guys have covered covered pretty much all of it. So is there anything else, Roberto, that, that you'd like to say or any questions you'd like to ask at all? Uh, no, like um, you guys have uh, been great. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Chris. Chris Taylor as well. Uh, I, from my point, I would like just to add that maybe because of what I heard at the beginning, if you guys are not very interested in this type of business model, uh, I am sure that there are many of the companies that you relate with that could work out in this sort of way, right? So uh, I would love to keep on conne uh, connecting with you guys and uh, I'm available for whatever you want. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> I see some uh, see some similarities between eSports Mania and, and some things that I've done in the past. And I think my only concern is, is there too, is there too much that's being worked on at the moment? Too many different things? Or what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, that, that was exactly what I was going to start with. It feels like they're going in a lot of different directions. And sometimes I think, you know, in these early stages, it's about finding that core focus um, and figuring out what are you best at and, you know, really going into that first and then expanding out of it. Um, I don't think you want to cast too wide of a net too soon. Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, it's it, it's tough when when you want to to build a brand as as big as I, I, I feel like Roberto wants to do, which is not a bad thing. And uh, I do completely understand where he's coming from, where uh, Mexico is, is drastically underserved from an esports point of view. And there are so yeah. many ways for him to, to ingrain himself in esports mania in Mexican culture, and especially within the gaming space. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, that, that, that most likely will be the problem where you, over you know, at least in the short to intermediate term, you're 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 good at a lot of things, but not great at, at one thing, which which allows somebody else to enter the space as well. And um, that would probably be my 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 biggest concern there. Yeah, I've had that problem a lot in the past myself. But and the only defense for that really is um, you're able to see so many different things that then that then you can as long as you're nimble enough, which you are as a startup, to start dropping off the things that aren't working and really focus on the things that do work. And, you know, talking about that a lot in my content, for us at Big Esports in Australia, a lot of it was initially trying to focus on just that pure esports consultancy and really just trying to push that rock uphill all the time. And, you know, one of our partners in the CEO of Place of Studios, Jerry, just said, just look at your revenue. Where's it coming from? And for us, it was coming from influencers without us even trying. We were getting 70% plus revenue from there. So it just made sense for us then to double down in that area and to soften up on the rest of it. But I can definitely see what you guys are saying about yeah, focusing on too many things it can be hard, and I've been there many times. Been there many but times. but I I really do like what he's doing there because this is actually one thing we we've talked about here before is that um, you know everybody thinks that you know, there's basically three markets and it's Europe, uh, China, and the U.S. But um, what we like to look at is these these emerging markets in this space like. Like India and, and Egypt and South Africa and Argentina and obviously Mexico and 
Um, there's there's so much room for esports to grow that I do believe there will be. I mean, I, I, like I mentioned in it, where you know when you think of Astralis, you 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 think of of Danish, and that's that's their they they built that brand, and they've. I mean, obviously you think of CS:GO as well, but it's like they are the Danish esports organization. So um, I do I do really like what he's doing from this perspective. He's not just a another organization or another company that's just going to be equal to or or worse than everybody else that's doing the exact same thing. He's going to he's going it, it, it's probably at the right time. I, I personally do not know enough about the the Mexican esports market that I probably should, but um, I would say I, I really haven't heard much coming from there. So he's he's definitely going in the right direction. Now it's just about focusing. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's that's really true, and I think you know, like like you were saying, they're focused on Brazil as well. And I've been shilling the Brazilian market for the past few weeks because when I did some research, it just blew my mind. The engagement rates across Twitter for Brazilian esports organizations is ridiculous. It's far higher than most other regions. Um, you look at the rise of Free Fire there as well. Corinthians, the team that won, have was it somewhere between seven hundred k to a million Instagram followers themselves, and they're a single game organization and a mobile title. Um, you look at the Free Fire finals in Brazil, the concurrent viewership that it hit was was top five um, in the world last year for esports titles. And even if you look at just their local League of Legends market, it's not uncommon at all to see League of Legends players who are the bottom in the top tier having 5, 10, 15,000 Twitter followers themselves. The esports teams like INTZ, et cetera, having 100,000 Twitter followers and that kind of stuff. And that's quite comparable to, you know, these COD um, World League franchise spots and these Overwatch World League spots, but they function in Brazil, which is a l much lower socioeconomic area. It's cheaper to exist in that place, and also they're not paying a thirty million dollar franchise fee to have a similar digital reach to these people. I mean, and I, the region, the other language too. Yeah, and uh, I know that you know. I think you say it's like Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina combined generate like four billion in gaming revenue every year. So, mm. and it's it's. It, it it just seems like the market's just it's, it's ready it's ready and ripe to for for some sort of disruption in, in, in esports and um mm -hmm. and it just it's it's waiting to happen I mean everyone I mean we just we, we look at these these consistent charts and just you know esports is worth a billion dollars and it's just it hasn't even ingrained itself in so many markets to to get to the next level yet. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's part of what I like that Roberto was talking about is there's a lot of gaming, not just esports in here. And, you know, I'm doing some research for some thing I'm doing with KPMG coming up, and mostly that's around influencers. And looking at the market size, it's not comparable. Like you were saying, you know, in, in those three, in that region alone, um, gaming is worth $3 billion. But in the whole world, esports is worth $1 billion. Um, mm. You know, you look at the global games market versus esports. You know, esports is 10%. Um, you look at even just influencers as a, as a general market, um, you know, I think that was an $8 billion market in 2019, looking to forecast it to get between 11 to 13 this year in 2020. So if you're able to dip into these other kind of areas, and now we know there's so many crossovers, you know, we're working with a boxer and an NFL player to come into esports. They both want to sign with a team. You know, you've got Offset investing in FaZe. You've got Drake investing in 100 Thieves. So it seems to me that it would be obvious that, you know, these other developing regions will start to follow that. You haven't really seen sports celebrities in Australia investing yet. You've only seen the business people. And I haven't, I, have, I don't have case studies that I'm aware of, of Latin America either, of these massive football stars investing into these teams and organisations too. The other thing that I think might kickstart Mexico is MK Leo recently signed with T1, mm -hmm. um, previously SKT1, the um, Korean, the, the South Korean massive StarCraft organisation and League of Legends powerhouse. So that might help to, to kickstart some of that stuff in the region too. And we saw that here in Australia um, when the Ren when the Renegades boys became Renegades and now they've signed with 100 Thieves. That's been a big boost for our local market here. There's a lot of brand affinity from people going to 100 Thieves and a lot of action and discussion. And, you know, Fnatic owns a Rainbow Six Siege team that's from Australia as well. So hopefully we can see that start to come to Mexico and that might be a way to kind of force the maturity of the market, get some more, um, you know, get some more big brand names down into there. Yeah, cool. All right, well... We'll add all the guys back for the end of the stream. Bill, Cody, Roberto, Hello. welcome. welcome. We'll, start from, may as well start from left to right, the same order that, that we had you guys on. Bill, how did you, you find the experience and was there any any other points that you wanted to bring up from our discussion? Uh, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed the experience. I enjoyed the questions. Thank you guys for listening to my pitch. 
asked me all these really, really, uh, you know, hard hitting questions. Uh, I think, um, I stood up for like 30 seconds, and when I got back in, Cody was like, and that's why we're better than AI coaching. So I didn't quite, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I can't quite respond to everything, but I, like, I think um, you know, the difference between what I'm trying to do and what Cody's trying to do is really two different regimes, right? So I, I mentioned that like 30% of players have this issue. On the first round of Counter-Strike, they don't buy anything. And that's 30% of, sorry, like 25% of Counter-Strike players is... You know, was that four million players? Like there aren't enough coaches to go point out all those mistakes. So we we sort of operate in different regimes. I think um, there's definitely a way for us to work together, and um, uh, you know, I think we we both add value in different ways. That's, that's uh, yeah, much it. yeah. I agree. I agree. How about you, Katie? How was it? Uh, overall, awesome. Uh, on that note, Bill, when you're doing your Fortnite division, I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, I definitely have some ideas there. Um, but overall, yeah. love the stream, love the setup. The format was great, uh, and really appreciate all the feedback. Awesome. And Roberto, fresh, fresh off, and back in again. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sweating like a pig, but uh, to be honest, like, uh, for, for me, English is my second language, and I tried my best in that part. But yeah, like awesome. Like to be honest, I I love that. Uh, you, Chris, are kind of like, uh, well, I've been following you for a long time here in LinkedIn and uh, kind of like establishing this uh, professional way of uh, linking uh, VCs with companies, startups, and things like this, right? So that's something that I, we lack here. Of course, in Mexico, there's nothing like that, but in the US, there are already companies that are uh, focused on investing in esports. And that's, of course, mm -hmm. one of the key things that we want to explore eventually. Yeah, I think f for you too, feel free to introduce me to some, some more people in esports in Mexico. would love to chat to them. I think um, I know that the Brazilians love to stick together. When I did one, I got requests from many, many more and many introductions. So hopefully it's, it's similar in Mexico and, yeah, yeah. and Argentina and Chile as well. I can start talking to some more cool people. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. And, and thanks to everyone who have has been tuning in live or watching the VOD later, whether you're on LinkedIn, Twitch TV, or watching this VOD on YouTube. As always, we're back again in two weeks' time. I think we're going to stick with this time slot, which is one hour earlier than what we used to have. So we'll see you all again in two weeks with two new investors and three new founders. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Yep. See ya.